Well, as they say, all good things must come to an end, and even this course must come to an end. Today what I want to do is to summarize what we've covered during this course, remind you of some of the important results we've obtained, and give you an idea of how you could continue your study in the future. Well, we've covered a lot of ground since the beginning of the lectures, that's for sure. I count over 700 slides that we've gone through, and that's a lot of material for anybody, and some of the material has been pretty advanced. It's going to take you some time to digest and understand the material and become more comfortable with it. And the best way to get good at this kind of thing is to work through the problems. If you work through a problem and you don't cheat and look at the answer and you struggle with it until you understand exactly how it works, then you remember it for a good long time. If you just treat things as a flurry of facts that come and go, the problem is they usually go when you need them. You can go back, luckily, in this format of viewing these lectures online, you can go back and review at any time and you can refresh your memory and that's one real advantage of the leverage that this kind of format gives us. Um, I'll just remark that um, our treatment of atoms uh, was at a much higher level I think than many courses have time for. That was uh, partly a reaction to the kind of cursory treatment that our textbook gave that material and partly the idea that there could be people who want to tune in and find out something who are in more advanced courses than typically uh, at this level and they can use that material too. Okay, um, we had quantum mechanics, it was motivated by some early experiments. Science is about a trial and error basically. That's the most powerful method in science. And you've got to do an experiment and you've got to try to control all the things you can control so that you know that the things that you're changing are making a difference. And that's why a good scientist records as much information about what's going on as is uh, possible. Um, we had several experiments that were really key. One was the very simple experiment of the distribution of radiation from a so-called black body, like lamp black, at a temperature T which could be measured. That distribution was simple, it didn't seem to depend on anything except the temperature, and it was completely unexplainable by classical mechanics. The second key experiment was the photoelectric effect, which again disagreed and seemed to indicate that light might have a particle nature, that perhaps Newton's idea uh, was correct. And the third was the double slit experiment, which um, seemed to indicate that an electron could go through both slits, but that's a more recent experiment. And um, the uh, earlier experiment was just that the electrons could diffract from a nickel crystal, and so that the electrons seemed to have a wave property because waves diffract and particles do not. And finally, there was, we, we touched on it briefly, but there was just the stability of atoms and chemical bonds, um, both of which were very difficult to explain with classical mechanics and were left as kind of an unsolved riddle. But um, so classical mechanics was floundering on all these fronts, and whenever our theory of knowledge is floundering, that means that we have to think more deeply and we need to perhaps invent a new idea. And this was of course an extremely exciting time, but it was clear that a mechanics of the small, so to speak, was needed. And that we couldn't just extrapolate from our everyday experience with big objects when we got down to these very tiny particles. As far as we can ascertain right now, um, quantum mechanics is basically completely unchallenged in the domain of its applicability. In other words, it's really a theory worth learning because it allows you to figure out things to many decimal points of accuracy and to explain all kinds of interesting uh, phenomena and design very tiny circuits that you can use in computers and so on and so forth. 
And without it, you're basically lost in any of those applications. We talked about matter and radiation. In particular, matter has a wave-like aspect quantified by the de Broglie wavelength, and radiation has a particle aspect, which we saw when we de dealt with the photoelectric effect. This kind of wave-particle duality, that in fact something can appear to have different uh, properties depending on what you ask about the object, um, allows us to explain all these experiments like photons ejecting electrons essentially instantaneously from a metal surface in a vacuum and electrons diffracting from crystals. The wave function we decided is the fundamental object in quantum mechanics. That's the thing that's common to everything and if we know the wave function then we know all that it is possible to know about the quantum mechanical system. That means, as a corollary, that usually we do not know the wave function in all its glory. We only know some aspect of it depending on what we've chosen to measure, but we don't know everything that it's possible to know about most systems, even very small quantum systems where we're trying to control everything. And all we can know is the probability density or probability amplitude, which is the wave function, but what we measure is the probability density, and that's the fundamental thing. And um, philosophically, that's very frustrating to some people that um, when we prepare things in identical states, often it seems like we get random uh, results, but there are many analogous things. When we throw a, a die, we get one through six, and uh, we get that at random, and you could argue, well, that the die is uh, not thrown the same way, but if all six sides of the die were identical, so you couldn't see them when they were in your hand, you couldn't see beforehand what you were going to get, then you couldn't tell which way it was, and when you threw it, then it appears as a number, then that number appears to be random when you, when you look at it. The state of the physical system is given by this wave function which we capitalized and we put a semicolon and T when it depended on time and it depends on the positions of all the constituents of the quantum system. Um, classically they would be the coordinates of the particle although um, it kind of begs the question if you're saying the coordinates of the particles that you think you know where they are, but in fact what you're doing is treating these as parameters in the wave function, and the wave function is the fundamental thing. When we make a measurement, we represent that with a linear Hermitian operator, and the only possible result of an ideal measurement is one of the eigenvalues of the linear Hermitian operator, which because it's Hermitian has real eigenvalues. And once we make a measurement, then the system has been altered, usually, by that measurement, unless we're measuring the exact same thing again, in which case um, we know the result we're going to get in that peculiar case, because we've done an experiment that rules out all the other probabilities, and then if we do the same experiment again, it's like, rather like throwing the dice on the table and then just not throwing them again and just looking again at what's up. So you didn't give it any chance to change. And the set of all possibilities of these measurements, just like the six numbers on the die, um, constitute a complete set. They tell you everything that can possibly happen. You can't have something outside that. And that's very important because that means that we can make up a wave function as a linear combination of these eigenstates. When we make a measurement, we generally change the wave function. And um, if we have, first of all, a superposition, which I've written here on slide 691 as the sum over n of cn phi n, and then we make a measurement, we put on O hat, on, on an eigenstate phi n and we get an eigenvalue O n and we know if the um, measurements give a different eigenvalue 
but the functions are orthogonal, which is expressed by the integral of the product being zero, then after we obtain the result OK, um, O sub K, um, the probability of obtaining that result is given by the square of the expansion coefficient, C sub K squared. Um, and after that, the wave function has been irreversibly changed. And now the wave function has changed to the eigenstate phi sub k. That seems to be kind of a collapse of probability because we had this big thing, the wave function, and then we made a measurement and then it, it collapsed. And now it's in this um, state. But of course, um, that might not be quite the right way to look at it. It might be a bit more complicated than that. But you, you could ask exactly how does this collapse of the wave function happen? Um, and actually that's somewhat open to question like a lot of things in quantum mechanics. The actual equations are not open to question, but mechanisms and interpretations and reasons why certain things happen is open to question and some people temperamentally dismiss that as irrelevant and other people are quite interested in it. But for example, suppose we flip a coin, then before we flip it the chance of getting heads is 50 percent. But after we flip it, after we make the measurement, then the chance of getting heads is suddenly 100 percent if we got heads. And that doesn't seem to bother us that there were two possibilities and now there's one and we kind of boosted the probability afterwards back up to 100 percent if we then start doing other things with the coin. And, and uh, so perhaps that's not so strange that that can happen. Then we talked about uncertainty and when two operators don't commute, that means they're incompatible and that's measured by taking the difference in the order, the commutator, and I've shown you the commutator reminded you what it is for position and momentum. It's IH bar and that means that we can't measure those variables to arbitrary precision simultaneously. One measurement causes the wave function to change and then the other measurement is imprecise and vice versa and so you keep um, sort of stepping on your own shoelaces over and over as you try to repeatedly measure um, the properties. We're certain of this uncertainty. There's been a lot written on the uncertainty principle which amounts to philosophy using the word uncertainty and somehow indicating that this is a very deep uh, thing. But the uncertainty principle itself is just a technical detail concerning whether operators commute or not and whether measurements can be made to arbitrary precision. It doesn't leave open huge uh, unfathomable uncertainty about other things. That's kind of a misuse or, uh, of the word uncertainty and is nothing really to do with the principle itself. Um, left alone, uh, the wave function will evolve in time according to the time-dependent Schrodinger equation h hat psi is equal to i h bar d psi dt. We really didn't re deal in this course with much time dependent phenomena and that's where you could have a springboard into a more advanced course is to look more deeply at time dependent phenomena. What we did is we, st we uh, said look we want to find out the property of a helium atom or a molecule or something like that that's left alone first. What is it like in nature and what's the ground state and it, we know that um, left alone it's not changing, it has certain properties, it's persisting in time and we call these stationary states and for a stationary state the wave function changes phase which you can interpret as the shape staying the same and it keeps changing color but the shape stays the same and the color is indicating time passing. But when we square it and we just figure out where the piles of sand are, it's all the same. And so there's nothing we can actually see from that stationary state that's actually changing. 
and the stationary states turn out to be the energy eigenstates. And that's why solving for the energy of these systems is so important, because those states are the ones that have the staying power to persist in time. And for the energy eigenstates, we can solve the equation exactly, and we find that we just get a complex exponential times whatever the probability distribution is at time zero. So the wave function changes phase, as I said, and, is, and nothing else. And you should think of that as changing color. Then we talked about bound states and quantization of energy. Um, it arises somehow when the particles bound. And the reason it arises in the most fundamental reason is because the wave function has to fit into the space allocated to it. And it can't come round, for example, on a ring and have a different phase than when it went around before. It has to match up perfectly, otherwise it interferes with itself. And more generally, the wave function, being a wave, can interfere with itself. And unless we have cons uh, interference that remains constant in time, that doesn't just cancel out to zero, we aren't going to see anything. So you could imagine some of the other energies not on the ladder of states that we derive as the solution to our equation could be there, but there could be something wrong. The wave function may blow up and go to infinity, so it's not normalizable, it doesn't have a proper probability, or it could cancel. It could go around and it could cancel itself out, in which case it's zero, and either one of those things kills it. Uh, we found for a particle in a box that the ladder of states went like n squared, and there is zero probability of being found outside the box. On the other hand, for the gentler slope of the harmonic oscillator, not so steep like a box, but just x squared, then the levels went like n. They were all evenly spaced. And that's a very, cla that's a very classic case to study because it's simple to solve and we solved it and got the ground state being a Gaussian function. And then the hydrogen atom is another one we can solve and here the levels go like uh, uh, minus e o over n squared and again we have an infinite number of levels but um, there's a lowest one and as they come up to some level that we call zero there which is an isolated proton and an electron at infinity um, we have an infinite number of levels in there, but they're within a finite uh, band. Then we saw that a particle could tunnel through a barrier. So it could magically, so to speak, get around some sort of barrier and appear on the other side. Um, as far as I'm aware, there is no experiment that tries to measure the transit in the barrier. The particle is in front of the barrier and it comes out on the other side, as far as I'm aware. But we do find that particles can and do appear outside where they're supposed to be. For example, radioactive decay of an alpha particle. Um, the alpha particle is part of the nucleus and then suddenly it appears out here because it has a wave function and there's some probability of being out there. And finally it is out there and once it is out there and the strong force is not holding the two particles together, it's ejected at top speed like about five million electron volts. And that certainly wouldn't be allowed if, if you looked at the barrier that you had to come over and you had to squeeze the thing uh, uh, through. We call that tunneling because the idea is you don't have to have the energy to go over the barrier, you can just somehow go through. In classical mechanics, this kind of behavior is just not allowed at all. In quantum mechanics, it happens all the time. And the less massive a particle is, the more likely it is to tunnel. So tunneling is very important for electrons and moderately important for hydrogen nuclei and H atoms and pretty much uh, diminishes in probability after that. On the other hand, if we have an unbound state, where they're just free to go anywhere, then 
the particle can have a continuous range of energies. Why? Because the wave function doesn't have to fit into anything. And then we've, we derived that the wave function looks like a corkscrew, corkscrewing left or right, depending whether the momentum of the particle is positive or negative. And so, the, as I mentioned, in some sense, quantization always arises because the wave function has to fit somehow into a confined space. A free particle that can just go anywhere it wants um, doesn't have to have any phase matching anywhere, and so it can have any energy. This idea of quantization that emerges as a property of this theory, it's not something we injected, uh, it emerges based on our fundamental postulates, is one of the main triumphs of quantum mechanics because it explains atomic spectroscopy and a million other things that are very, very important for everyday life and that classical mechanics completely trips up on. Then we talked about approximate solutions to the Schrodinger equation. We talked about perturbation theory and how to treat a known solution to the Schrodinger equation and then an additional thing which we hoped was small but sometimes it isn't small and we try it anyway and then sometimes we get it kind of a difficult conundrum out of that. Um, the reason we need things like perturbation theory is that sadly the equation that we have to solve is difficult enough that we can only solve it for the simplest um, ideal kind of model systems. We can't really solve it exactly for other systems and so we have to treat them as approximate solutions. But approximate in this game means as close as you like. It's just that we, we can't write in closed form the exact solution as, as here's the function. Um, but we can write things that are very, very close to many decimal points. And luckily for us, the hydrogen atom can be solved exactly. And those solutions for S, P, D, F, and so forth, and one, two, three, Four, um, those solutions guide our intuition about every other atom. When we think about a 2s orbital, we kind of intuitively think, well, it probably looks something like a 2s on hydrogen. And then, well, if the nuclear charge is bigger, we shrink it down. And then, well, it's not exactly the same because a 2s in another atom may have a 1s inside. And so things, there may be electron electron repulsion and so forth. But we kind of think in terms of this way, and as I showed you with the distribution functions, um, the probability of finding certain electrons at positions, um, they go like shells, and so it is accurate to think of 1, 2, 3, or KLM, and, and so forth, when thinking about atoms. We can use perturbation theory then to correct any exact solution as long as we have a small perturbation, but if we have a big perturbation, we have to be careful. And then the other approximate method that's quite important that we used over and over again is to introduce a parameter into the wave function and then optimize the parameter by adjusting it so that the energy is lowered. And that is a result of the, of the um, variational principle which states that the uh, wave function that is closest to the ground state in energy is, is better. And so if we have a, it, it, it's a compass for us. It's a way to know which way is north. We have to have some measure when we're trying to change the wave function and optimize it, whether it's getting better. And if the energy is going lower, then it's getting better. And if we have the exact wave function for the ground state, then we get the lowest energy possible. And that, that's very important. That's our metric for, to tell if we're doing the right thing or not. We talked about atomic spectroscopy, which follows a set of rules for dipole, electric dipole allowed transitions. Um, delta L is plus or minus one, delta N is anything, and so forth. Historically, it's these emission spectra that led to the empirical relationship for emission lines being differences of 1 over n squared, which Rydberg um, 
uh, formulated. Um, who knows how, but anyway, without knowing anything else, he just seemed to say, hey, this is a fourth minus a ninth, and this is a ninth minus a sixteenth. And it was amazing uh, uh, numerical insight to be able to do that. But it was still completely unexplained as to why they were those differences. But uh, quantum mechanics then came along and explained uh, those, but that was a very important clue. And then we talked about term symbols, which have the multiplicity 2s plus 1, where big S is all the electron spins added up according to the rules of angular momentum. L is the orbital angular momentum of all the electrons, and J is L plus S, which again um, follows the Klebsch-Gordon series, um, which goes down by 1 until it reaches the absolute value of L minus S. And those term symbols are a very compact way to, to categorize and keep track of atomic transitions in things like sodium and other atoms where we talked about the two yellow lines being very close, the two doublet P uh, three halves and doublet P one half both going to the doublet S uh, one half. And we talked about atomic structure and what I would say here is we did quite a bit on this but a l atomic electronic structure calculation, if you haven't figured it out already, it involves a lot of integrals. And a lot of those integrals are not so easy to do because they're multi-dimensional integrals and they have ugly things in them. And unless you adopt the right coordinate system, they're completely hopeless to do. If you try to do those integrals in Cartesian coordinates, you make no progress at all. You just end up with things that you can't integrate. And although we didn't do it, we, we introduced elliptical coordinates, but if we were getting serious about things like H2 and H2+, plus, um, we could simplify our work a lot if we were willing to adopt that coordinate system, which I didn't do. I just uh, stuck with spherical coordinates for simplicity and then did a lot of hard work. It's simplest in these calculations to use atomic units. Atomic units, um, are, we measure energy in Hartree and we set all the fundamental constants to one um, so that they're out of our hair and that, that way we get nice simple equations like minus one-half del squared and things like that that are much easier to write down. And we've already got enough work doing all these integrals without having some gigantic fraction out in front that we have to keep rewriting all the time and keeping track of. And then we remarked that there was a hidden advantage to doing it in these um, units, and that is that when the calculation is so accurate that if you make a revision to one of the fundamental constants by doing a different experiment, so you change the value of h bar slightly or you change the speed of light slightly, out here in some decimal point. Um, you don't want to have to redo everything all over, but if you've done it in this, these dimensionless units, you just automatically change the energy to update it when you put in the, the new units, and so you don't have to do it over because you didn't quote it in EV or kilojoules. And that's much better because the constants themselves can and do sometimes get revised. We did the hydride ion, and um, one thing we found out there is that it's a pretty tough nut to crack, even though in some sense it's the simplest uh, two-electron system. It's hard because the electron-electron repulsion, which is between two unit negative charges, and the attraction, which is between a negative charge and a positive charge, are about the same size. And so treating um, the electron-electron repulsion as a perturbation is treating something that's about as big as what you said was big as small. And what that um, gave us, unfortunately, was uh, an unstable situation where we predicted that the hydride anion would be unstable compared to a hydrogen atom and an electron at infinity. Remember we got minus three eight, uh, minus three eights rather than minus a half in atomic units. Then what we did is we expanded with our fr Greek friend Zeta, which now I'm sure you'll never forget this beautiful symbol. 
And we expanded um, the orbital and allowed that, introduced that as a variational parameter. And we tried to optimize that and it came darn close, but unfortunately it was not stable. And only a, a trial wave function where we, we hypothesized that we had one electron that was bound rather uh, tightly and another one that was further out and then the opposite because for symmetry we don't know which electrons which so we permute the possibilities when we took that one um, that gave a, a, a reasonable result for hydride but hydride is a very big anion as I remarked it's bigger than fluoride and so it's not that stable and it's quite a difficult problem to do by contrast helium when you introduce a plus two charge then this interaction is twice as big as this is in a repulsion and boy that helps you a lot when you start uh, doing it. Then we said look we had that wave function for hydride but that didn't consist of orbitals. An orbital is a one electron wave function and we like to think of a multi electron wave function for an atom as a product of orbitals. And because we have a one electron wave function, what we do is we smear out all the other electrons into just a vague cloud of charge according to the probability. And then we treat that probability not as an instantaneous thing, like what's actually going on, but as something that's already completed and done and not dynamic. And all it does then is change the potential energy then we solve, we turn the crank, we may need a computer or a lot of integrals, whatever we have to do, and we optimize the one live electron that we've got, and then we put that one into the soup and smear it out, and we grab another electron out of the hat, and we keep going around and around and around, on a computer usually, until none of the electron wave functions change. None of the one electron orbitals changes from one to another. And then in that case you can't improve it because if none of them change, none of them are going to change if you go through again either. And so at that point you quit and you say you've got a self-consistent field solution. Usually that solution is pretty good but it's never perfect and the reason it isn't is because it neglects the fact that electrons tend to in real life, electrons would tend to avoid each other, and that's called electron correlation. And therefore, theories that start with the self-consistent field or Hartree-Fock equations and then add correlation always give a better um, result if you treat the correlation uh, right. Okay, then we talked about the Pauli principle that the wave function should be anti-symmetric if we exchange the labels which we're calling one and which we're calling two for example and if the uh, wave function is factorizable if it factors into a spatial part times a spin part which often it does then if the spin part is symmetric the spatial part is anti-symmetric and vice versa this behavior we decided could be encoded in this neat device called a Slater determinant because a Slater determinant when you change um, columns or rows in a determinant it changes sign automatically and so it actually keeps track of this property for you. Not every wave function can be written as a single Slater determinant and that's one reason why we didn't do a lot with open shell um, atoms and things like that that could be more complicated. Then we talked about molecules and in particular we introduced the Born-Oppenheimer approximation which basically relied on the physical insight that the nuclei being more massive move slowly and the electrons move very rapidly and the electrons, the second the nuclei move a little, the electrons immediately readjust. They have time to go around the track time and time again, and they immediately readjust to whatever the new environment is. If they get squeezed out, they get pushed out, because the nuclei are coming together, fine. 
If the nuclei are going apart and they can hide in there, fine. But they find the right solution essentially immediately. There is no lag. And therefore, it, when we want to solve it, we can make an essential simplification. We solve a bunch of problems where the nuclei are frozen. And we just calculate the electronic energy and the internuclear repulsion with everything frozen. And that gives us an energy as a function of, let's say, two atoms moving apart. And that is a very fundamental thing to understand about the way chemists think, because that frozen approximation as a function of big R, which was our internuclear distance, that's called a potential energy curve or a potential energy surface if you have more than two. Um, and that allows us to organize all our thinking about how the nuclei move. So now we solve the electronic energy and then when we want to figure out what the nuclei want to do, we look at the electronic energy and we calculate a force and then we can see where the nuclei are going to move. They're going to try to roll downhill. They go too far, they're going to roll up and so forth. And so these curves um, allow us to quantify that. And recall that we had a couple of uh, empirical curves that we introduced early on with vibration, the Morse oscillator, and even the Leonard Jones 612 potential. The simplest molecule is H2+, which we did in some detail, and we could solve that under the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. And we decided we could make up a molecular orbital which was the analogous one electron wave function to an atomic orbital, except instead of just having one nucleus and solving one electron at a time, we have two nuclei and we solve one electron at a time. Well, H2 plus we can solve because it's only one electron. The fact that the nucleus has split apart isn't that big a deal. It makes the math worse, but it doesn't, doesn't change things in any other fundamental way. But when we get to H2, then we can't. Um, then it's too hard again because we've got two electrons. And most commonly then, what we do is we start out with some atomic orbitals and we take linear combinations of them. We add them, multiplied by numbers, but we do not multiply the functions. That's very important. We don't raise them to powers or take square roots of them or do something else. We just add them. We say you're 50% this and 20% that, and these numbers could have imaginary parts, this being quantum mechanics after all, but that's nothing worse than that. And this is called the LCAO MO, or Linear Combination of Atomic Orbitals Molecular Orbital Approach. Whenever we start out with a certain number, n, of atomic orbitals, we end up with the same number, n, of molecular orbitals. If we start out with 12, we end up with 12, and, uh, and it's always like that. And then we found we could classify our solutions by symmetry, and the lowest energy usually has the fewest nodes. And then as we go up, things start uh, increasing nodes, things going to zero in between the nuclei and very unfavorable things, and those are configurations of the electrons that are unstable for the molecule, so that's how the molecule can dissociate. Our rules for combining atomic orbitals were the following. They have to have similar energy. That's because they have to have similar de Broglie wavelength in order to interact. They have to have the same symmetry. And as I said in a more advanced course, you'll understand exactly what that means when you study point groups. Um, for now, just keep in mind that if one of them changes sign when you flip the molecule and the other one doesn't, those aren't going to interact. The integral is going to be zero, identically. And then, the third condition is that they have to overlap in space, because if they don't overlap in space, if the atoms are miles apart, there's not going to be a molecular orbital possible. They only have to be pairwise, though, if you have more than two. And bonding orbitals then build up electron density in between the nuclei. Anti-bonding orbitals often put nodes between the nuclei, and that's how you can tell. However, if the node is at the nucleus, 
um, then it's not particularly bad. It's just if it's between in a bond that it's bad. Um, we saw a couple of examples that I highlighted where the molecular orbital theory was superior to the uh, localized bond or Lewis structure approach. The first is that molecular oxygen is paramagnetic. The molecular orbital theory clearly predicts that we could have two unpaired electrons. That's what we observe. The other form, it, remember, is called singlet oxygen. And the other is that there, uh, that we saw, a simple example, is that there are two um, photoelectron bands in the UV photoelectron spectrum of methane. One of them we called A1 and one of them we called T2. And again, molecular orbital theory predicted that these four bonds that we draw were really three plus one, the one being rather different, the A1, remember, being like that big teddy bear. And the others had nodes, but they didn't have nodes between uh, the bonds. They had nodes um, at the carbon nucleus itself. And so they were net bonding. They, they glued things together. And the eight electrons went into there. And those, those two examples are two clear examples you can give where molecular orbital theory um, rather naturally predicts what we see and um, to go back and say well I've got four sp3 hybrids and I'm drawing these lines for bonds and so on and so forth um, doesn't really explain and it's very very difficult to figure out how you're going to explain it and that's because it's wrong even though it's useful in some cases. Then we uh, had this thing, the bond order is the difference between the number of bonding electrons minus the number of anti-bonding electrons divided by two. And although we didn't emphasize it much, there are non-bonding electrons, non-bonding orbitals, and those usually are sort of like what you would draw as lone pairs on a Lewis structure. And so they neither hurt nor help you. They aren't really involved in the active part of, of the structure holding the atoms together. Um, and we did a detailed calculation of the molecular orbitals for simple cases. And what we found out when we did that is that the so-called exchange integral was the one that causes the bond to be stable. And that exchange integral was basically purely a quantum mechanical effect that was not possible, would, would not be seen in classical mechanics. And that, in turn, explains how quantum mechanics naturally produces, uh, predicts that things like H2 and H2O and things like that are going to exist and be uh, more stable than the, the um, uncombined atoms. But in classical mechanics, this was just another conundrum uh, to figure out. We saw that our perfectly good um, LCAO MO solution for hydrogen, uh, molecular hydrogen H2, sort of fell apart when we considered the dissociation of H2 into two hydrogen atoms. And when we looked at that, what we realized is that the molecular orbital approach assigns equal weight to a so dissociating as to H atom and H atom and hydride and H plus or a proton. And that was the problem there. Um, by contrast, the so-called valence bond approach, the paper of Heitler and London, um, gave the correct prediction that it would come apart into two atoms. And what we realized then is we should keep our MO description when we've got the bond, but we shouldn't assume that our description that we got with this optimized geometry is going to be the correct solution at all geometries. And so what we have to do then is adjust our wave function as we adjust R, and the convenient way we did that was to mix in a certain amount of the anti-bonding orbital as a function of R. And when we did that and optimized it, we got the correct prediction again. We got the right ionization energy, the right bond dissociation energy. And 
we called this configuration interaction. So we had two configurations, two orbitals, and then they were mixing and uh, giving this interaction, and that gave us the correct result. And then finally, we closed by talking about delocalized system of electrons, pi systems. Uh, I think all organic chemists think of these kinds of arom so-called aromatic systems in terms of molecular orbitals. Uh, we draw alternating single and double bonds, but chemists never think of them that way. They think of a delocalized pi system because the alternating single and double bonds doesn't predict the chemistry at all. And when we filled up, we, we did a detailed molecular orbital diagram, and what we found out is that all the sigma bonds were all just full, and then there were these two that were just half full, so to speak, in the middle, and we could treat those two, just looking at them, just the p electrons in these alternating um, single and double bonds, um, just the same way as H2. In other words, the math was the same, and so why not just recycle it and reuse it? And in the Huckel approximation, what we did is we simplified, um, if we had a bigger system, we just simplified, we said, um, the overlap of an orbital with itself is one, big deal, that means it's normalized. And then we said the overlap of an orbital with its neighbor is zero. Now that seems to contradict the idea of forming a molecular orbital because I said they have to overlap. But keep in mind the overlap, the s, was usually just a correction term in the denominator, um, 2s plus squared to 2s plus 1 and so on, um, to correct for the fact that um, you're losing some probability, but it doesn't change the form of the solution. The fact that things move apart is nothing much to do with S. And so it turns out that saying S is zero and then still making a bond is okay because it's the other part that's making the bond and you don't say beta zero. So you have some energy terms we called alpha and, some, and we said they're all the same for identical carbon. And then some energy terms we call beta the off-diagonal ones, and then you can solve that and you find the cyclic systems with 4n plus 2 uh, pi electrons are especially favorable. When we did the same kind of thing for cyclobutadiene, we predicted um, a, a diradical instead because the two um, uh, energy levels were the same. That could be what happens or it could be that the molecule distorts so that one's lower, but then, then it's localized bonds if it does that, because we'd have to solve it over. So here's our summary then. Quantum mechanics is really a deep and very beautiful description of atoms and molecules. It certainly isn't easy, but it's not impossible either. And most of it comes down to just having enough knowledge of mathematics so that you can understand what the equations are on about and you can solve them. And then once you reach that level, then you can focus on what it means and you can understand what it means in terms of science and chemistry and not be lost in, in details. Certain aspects of quantum mechanics, I'd say, remain hard to understand. For example, if you want a concrete explanation of exactly how an electron goes through both slits at once, um, that's very difficult. I don't think anybody can give you an explanation of that because for one thing, the only time it does that is when you don't look. And if you don't look, quantum mechanics says you don't really know what's going on. And so you can't propose some mechanism by which you have no experiment to measure. In quantum mechanics, you have to propose an experiment that measures something. And when we measure, then we find out, well, it went through definitely one slit or the other. So if we have a possibility of measuring. But if we don't measure, then both, both possibilities are entertained um, simultaneously. Nevertheless, even though the interpretation or some features of this theory uh, can be hard to understand in terms of everyday behavior of objects, 
When it comes to calculating atomic and molecular properties, when you need to get something right, this theory is unparalleled. It seems to be an extremely accurate and versatile theory and you can do lots of work with it. And I would say, in my experience, quantum mechanics remains completely unchallenged in the small world. I hope you've enjoyed the topics we've covered and I hope that you go on to learn more about chemistry and science. Thanks.